It's great to be here in Singapore with you, and we're very excited to present to you uh, our latest research on the breach attack. So today we're going to show you the latest findings that we have, our um, latest techniques for uh, uh, extending this attack, and uh, we're going to also show you our um, tools that we've developed and we're making uh, available today. So uh, first, a few words about who we are. My name is Dionysis. Uh, I'm, I'm here with my colleague Dimitris. And uh, we are researchers at the Security and Crypto Lab at the University of Athens in Greece. So uh, just uh, uh, what we're going to show you today is that HTTPS is broken. And, well, we knew that from Black Hat 2013. But today we're going to show you that, well, we kind of thought we fixed this by switching to block ciphers with AES. But, in fact, AES is also vulnerable. So we'll show you why this is true. And uh, we'll show how you can cryptanalyze HTTPS. So first I want to gauge a little bit of the audience. Who here uh, was or is aware of the breach talk in Black Hat 2013? Raise your hands. OK, not too many people. So we're going to go through the original Black Hat um, breach attack um, real quick. And then we're going to show you our um, latest findings. So. Here's the overview of today's talk. Uh, first, we will review the original breach attack, and then we'll, we will go to our contributions. We will show you um, some statistical methods of performing this attack. And, and then we will show you um, how these can be used to attack both block ciphers and noisy endpoints. And then uh, we will move on to some optimization techniques that we can use to make the attack uh, much, fa much faster. And finally, we will present our tool, which is called Rupture. And we will end the presentation with some suggestions for how to mitigate uh, this attack for good. So that's the plan for this next hour. So the original breach research was presented in Black Hat USA 2013 by this gentleman over here, Angelo Prado, with his two uh, colleagues, Neil Harris and Joel Kluck. Uh, we're very grateful to you, Angelo, for helping us also with this uh, latest research here. Uh, we have based a lot of our work on their, their paper and their presentation. All right, so how does breach really work? Well, this is a, a schema that shows how the attack works. We have a victim in the middle, and this is the user browsing the internet on a coffee shop. The attacker has access to the network of the victim and can do various injections and measure things on the network. So this is the attacker, and the victim visits HTTP websites like CNN or Amazon or eBay. And what the attacker can do is they can alter the HTTP responses to include arbitrary JavaScript code. So this is regular HTTP browsing. This is a standard uh, editor cap or red editor cap um, alternation of data on the network. And then this code executes on the victim's machine and connects back to the attacker and opens up a con command and control channel. And then this command and control channel can be used to make requests to a different endpoint, which we call the target website. For, for this example, it's Gmail. Uh, and this connection is HTTPS. And because of same origin policy, the JavaScript that runs in the CNN context is not able to, of course, read the data, but the attacker can see the data encrypted passing through the network. So this way, uh, we can issue thousands of requests from the browser of the victim. And of course, these requests include authentication cookies. So the response will contain secrets. Right? So this is the basic anatomy of the attack. You hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, original breach uh, presented some uh, assumptions in order for the attack to be performed uh, correctly. We will uh, use some of these assumptions and we will also relax some others. So, first of all, the target website should use HTTPS. And uh, in this case, we don't uh, mind if it also uses HTTPS. Uh, the response also should be compressed uh, using GZIP. And uh, although the original breach uh, actually attacked uh, websites that uh, used stream, stream ciphers. Uh, we will relax this on also to block ciphers. Uh, finally, the response uh, should have zero noise, and uh, most importantly, it should contain a, a parameter that is actually reflected inside the response. Um, that is, the, uh, the attacker should be able to inject some, some uh, plain text of his own into the URL response. Into the response. So, 
The target of the original bridge was actually uh, to steal some CSRF tokens, and uh, by doing that, uh, the attacker could impersonate the victim client to the server. We will extend this to other secrets as well. So, uh, okay. So, uh, Tai Duong in uh, 2012 in Crime showed that uh, presented the web uh, length leaks. That is, uh, if the plain text of uh, if a plain text is uh, has smaller length, the, if a plain text A has smaller length than a plain text B, then the encrypted plain text, uh, the encrypted cipher text corresponding to plain text A, should also have a smaller uh, length than the encrypted uh, cipher text of plain text B. So, in this case, we we'll, uh, we actually use this in order to. Uh, find a secret in the uh, target website. So, let's see what uh, Gmail offers. Uh, Google offers a mobile uh, view on Gmail, which can uh, actually uh, use a, a, a mobile search functionality, which uh, uses post, but also works on get. So, we can search using get parameters, and actually this, this parameter that we we, we use is reflected in the response body. And this parameter is also, and this body also includes a CSRF token that actually uh, is valid for all of Gmail. So uh, we as the attacker can inject our own code and this, uh, our own plain text, and this plain text will be compressed along with a CSRF token for all of Gmail. In this case, we see uh, such a, a, a response. Okay, we see such a response. Uh, in this case, uh, we have some noise, and the noise is this uh, token here. So this token is randomly generated and uh, per request. So uh, we can't control it. Uh, we also have our reflection. This here is our search uh, parameter. And also we have the token, which is the secret. So in this case, what is our methodology? Uh, we, in order to, uh, to to perform the attack, the attacker should uh, guess some part of the secret. And uh, in order to do that, he needs to know a prefix of the secret. Well, in this case, uh, Google actually has made our life easier because uh, this prefix right here, the, si the six first symbols of the token, are constant across uh, accounts and uh, logins. So you can use it against everyone. Uh, so, in order to bootstrap the attack, we begin with the known prefix, we extend it, and in this instance we have found some more uh, characters until u4, and until u, and in this case we are, we are testing uh, the next character, which is the four, is four. So, in this case, four is the correct one, and we expect the reflected uh, plain text to be compressed well with the token, and to result in smaller compressed uh, ciphertext compared to, say, five or six. Uh, so, attack methodology, as we showed, is extending the secret one character at a time by beginning uh, with the known prefix. This results in a complex of uh, big O, N times sigma, where N is the length of the alphabet of the secret, and uh, sigma is the alphabet of the secret. So. What are our, our contributions? Well, we will extend the bridge attack and uh, we'll show some alternative secrets instead of CSRF tokens that can be uh, stole, actually stolen. We'll attack uh, noisy endpoints, and by noisy, uh, by noise, I mean either uh, some induced noise by the uh, endpoint, like the, the random token that we showed, or the block cipher which actually introduces noise in our responses. We'll optimize the attack in order to perform well against these endpoints. And finally, we'll propose some mitigation techniques that could actually uh, completely eradicate the attack. So what are those alternative secrets? Well, actually, anything that is contained in the response plain text body is a possible secret. So this is, this is uh, G, uh, Gmail emails, Facebook chat messages, uh, some uh, financial data, or anything else. So Facebook has uh, actually used a mitigation technique by masking the CSRF tokens, which is actually good, but uh, it's not enough because although it, it prevents the attack against the tokens, it is not uh, working 
for other secrets in the, in the uh, response body. So, um, our most important contribution, actually, is uh, the statistical methods that we implement in order to bypass noise. And, Dionysus? So, okay, what is our statistical method? Well, what we want to do is, basically, we want to make multiple requests per candidate uh, symbol, and instead of just doing one, and then we want to extract just a mean. And this was also uh, a comment in the original breach work, and uh, the authors are right that the, it adds a square root of m parameter there, where m is basically the, uh, the difference between the maximum possible noise and the minimum possible noise. And so we have this extra factor here which makes the attack actually slower. And the reason this works is the, the law of large numbers. If you, if you take more samples from the same uh, distribution, you see that the, um, the variance is, becomes smaller and it, uh, it converges to the mean. And, and the, the, the statistical mean converges to the distribution mean. Right, so how do we do this for specifically for block ciphers? Well, it's actually quite simple. What we do is we uh, perform 16 requests per uh, candidate symbol instead of just one. And in each of these requests, we pad, uh, we, we add some padding in the reflection, in the reflection uh, value. And this results in sometimes blocks being aligned. Right, and so I'll show it to you um, in a, in a bit, and how this works in, in a uh, diagram. So we introduce some artificial noise. Uh, and that artificial noise is basically just some random characters that are um, added to the reflection, and this causes the ciphertext to either cross or not cross a, uh, a boundary. So okay, this is uh, a bunch of requests that we're doing, so you can see them in the background. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see the exact um, URLs here, but these are, these are the base URLs, and this is the reflection that we're using. I will explain. If you can't see it, it's okay. I will read it. Uh, so this is the target endpoint. It's just a, a PHP um, URL in this case. And then uh, there is a reflected parameter called REF, and the equal symbol. And then we have the reflection, reflection value. And this is exactly what, we'll be, what we're searching for, for example, in Gmail. And um, here you can see a, a, a prefix of the secret that we know. In this case, it's impair. And then we have the candidate that we're trying, which is A. Uh, and so you can see all of these requests contain exactly the same uh, guess. And then the, we'll fill it up with a um, Huffman pool, which is exactly the same technique as in the original breach. But the new thing that we're doing here is that we're adding some extra padding here, which is just five random characters. So you can see this here. And we call this the block alignment alphabet. And so you can see in the first, in the first request, we have zero uh, block alignment. And here we have one, then two, up to 15. And so at some point, it will uh, reach the block boundary, and it will create a new block. So you can see this here. So let's say, the, for example, uh, the, we know the, the five first characters of the secret. It's secre. And then we're trying to guess if it's T or U or V. Right? And the red ones are the wrong ones, and T, of course, the green one is the right one. And uh, you can see we have added here some padding at the end, XY. And um, you can see that XY was the wrong padding. So this compresses to 15, 16, 16, but because it's encrypted with AES, this is rounded up to 16 exactly. But if we, if we guess the right um, padding at the end, then this will cause the last byte to spill into a new block. So we can see this on the network. It's 16 new bytes. And um, this is exactly what's happening there. And this is compressed to, this is a, it, it contains a compressed text of just one byte, but it's expanded to 16 by the block cipher. Right. So, noises? Okay. So, uh, in this case, in our experiments, we used actually zero noise because we had a, an endpoint that we could control. So, uh, response body had the plain text response body actually contain zero noise. But the problem is that even this is not enough. Uh, there are some, uh, some noises that uh, we can't predict. Uh, such noise is, uh, can, can be found in the HTTP header. So the connection field in the HTTP header can either take a value of close or keep alive. In the, f in the first case, there are three or four uh, less bytes. So this would result, uh, HTTP header is not actually compressed with the response body, but it is encrypted. So these three more bytes will actually result probably on uh, one more block. And uh, we don't like that because it might affect our results. 
Another case of uh, noise is uh, the, actual half, the actual Huffman coding. So in this case, uh, we, can't, we can't predict how Huffman tree will be encoded in, during compression because we don't know the response body. We don't know the plain text. So even after that, we also introduce our, our noise in order for the block alignment. So we don't know how this noise for the block alignment will affect the Huffman tree and consequently the compression and the encryption that we finally see. Uh, so it is, uh, it should be, it's, there should be more investigation at how Huffman is, uh, is actually uh, made with GZIP and uh, if we can predict to some extent what uh, the result will be. And finally, another uh, noise problem is the content encoding, which may be chunked. So this will result in uh, the, compressed, uh, the compressed plain text being chunked, and the batteries may change per request, and this may affect our results. OK, so let's move on to some of our optimizations to uh, bypass this, these problems. We have, uh, we propose here three optimizations. The first one is uh, the divide and conquer technique. The second one is the request soup. And the third one is the browser parallelization. Uh, actually, block ciphers it, it, of 180 bits, like uh, AES, uh, cause a, a 16 times slowdown. So these techniques should result in a 500 times speed up, uh, theoretically. Uh, what is divide and conquer? So divide and conquer uh, states that uh, in, instead of uh, issuing the request se uh, sequentially, one card at a time, we divide the alphabet in uh, two halves, the first one and the second one. And we try each half uh, repeatedly. Uh, in, uh, in this case, it, uh, okay, this is an example. So, we have taken this from uh, our implementation, and you can see here that in the first uh, request, uh, we have the first half of the alphabet, and we have also added the Huffman pool for the second half. And in the second half, in the second request, we have the, the opposite. Uh, so uh, in this case, the correct, uh, uh, we, for each alphabet, we, we append the testing candidates to the known prefix, in this case, impair. So in the first case, we try G, F, E, K, J, all this at the same time. In the second one, we try the others. The half of the alphabet that contains the correct uh, uh, candidate should result in a minimum uh, uh, mean length. So we should be able to see this. And after that, we can continue like that. So we try, uh, at first we have the whole alphabet, then we decide on the correct one, in this case the, the left, then the right, then the left, and all, all the way down until we have only one candidate. So this should be the correct one. And uh, what's, uh, what this, uh, this uh, technique actually, actually does is reduce our uh, complexity from big O n times uh, sigma to big O n times uh, uh, log sigma. So. Uh, in case we have an alphabet uh, of, say, 64 symbols, like uppercase letters, lowercase letters, digits, and hyphens, this would uh, practically give us a six times speed up. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is the divide and conquer technique. Um, unfortunately, divide and conquer does not always work. It, it causes a little bit more noisy behavior, and sometimes, to be honest with you, it, it can cause like the the mechanism to work less with less probability, right? So in that case, what you can do is you can fall back to the sequential technique and spend more time, but still get more uh, get results with more certainty. So uh, one one strategy could be you try with a divide and conquer technique, and if you don't have a, a lot of confidence, then you can use the sequential technique. And uh, we can actually extract confidence values by running the uh, running the attack, measuring multiple uh, running multiple requests for each candidate. So, as we said here, of course, um, this is not this is not going to be just one request. It's going to be multiple requests because you need the padding, right? So you need to combine this with the padding 
at the end, the block alignment padding. So uh, you, you, can run, you can run multiple samples, you can collect multiple samples, and if the difference in length is quite small, it's maybe less than one byte, uh, after collecting multiple samples, then you can say, okay, I'm not very confident about this. My confidence volume in bytes is less than one byte, and so I will resort to the sequential uh, strategy instead. Right. Um, the other technique that we use to optimize, we call it request soup. Um, this is an interesting technique. It's actually quite simple. Um, and the reason we can do this, we can do this optimization is because we need to collect multiple samples for the same candidate. So these, uh, these, uh, these multiple requests uh, are not adaptive based on each other. They are the, the exact same candidates, just with different paddings. So we don't really need to measure what is going on in the network in order to decide what to do next. So uh, what we can do is we can say, we can use the previous uh, command and control channel, and our attacker can say to the victim, OK, this is the candidate you want to try, and please add the, uh, the necessary padding of 0 up to 15, and maybe run this uh, 10 times. right? Run, so send 160 requ 60, uh, requests in batches of um, 16 um, for the respective uh, uh, block alignment padding, and all of these can go on the network together. They, we don't care, because what we want to extract is really just uh, the mean length. So what we do is we uh, send multiple requests from the client at the same time. Uh, and then the browser, of course, has specific behavior for this, and we collect the total uh, length of the ciphertext that we measure, and we are unable to, to tell which response corresponds to which request. They're not necessarily sent sequentially, but we don't really care. We just take the sum of the length, and we just divide it by the total amount of requests that were sent. And this way, we can extract the mean among all of our samples. And this actually speeds up the attack quite a bit. Uh, so how does, the, how does the browser do this? Right? If you just do the request soup idea, you have the browser uh, put one request uh, behind the other, pipelining them. But if you also uh, take uh, into advantage the browser parallelization, which is our other optimization, you notice that the browser can send up to six requests in parallel. Right, so this is a screenshot of how requests go, right? So you have six requests running in parallel, and then in the next, in the next moment you have six more requests running in parallel and six more requests running in parallel. Um, so really, we don't differentiate between any of these. We just run all of these together. They're both pipelined and parallelized, and we just measure the whole length. And this is why we call it a soup, because it's just responses coming all together, and we, we don't tell them apart. We just measure the total length. And because we don't need adaptation, uh, this, this gives us good results. So what does this mean in terms of time? Well, this is an indication. If we run a, a batch of 16 uh, requests together, we can do this in 1.5 seconds. Um, and in fact, as, as, uh, as you increase the number of requests here, this does not increase uh, li really linearly. It increases less than linearly because there is some overhead in communicating in the command and control channel and starting up new requests from scratch, etc. So the larger this is, if this goes up by 10, for example, this will go up by less than 10. So it's, it's quite good. If you want to collect more samples, uh, you don't really need proportional time. All right. So today is an important moment for our team. Um, this has been the work uh, of several months for us, and um, Rupture is what we call our implementation of these ideas. Uh, it's implementing all our optimization techniques, it's implementing all our statistical techniques, uh, and it's, uh, it's not a proof of concept, it's uh, complete uh, ready code to be, to you, that you can run on real systems, and uh, we are making it open source right here in Singapore and Black Hat Asia. And uh, we are inviting you to um, download it and modify it and play with it and try it on your own website and play with different targets and so on, right? So what is Rupture? Well, it's available right here. Right now, you can go on this URL. It's just been made public by my team uh, back in Greece. And we also have it here in the URL, rupturewit.com. Um, you can read also our uh, white paper here, which describes um, uh, many details of our attack that we cannot um, just uh, tell you in only one hour. And uh, it's MIT licensed. Um, in fact, we keep track of all our bugs and issues in that uh, GitHub, GitHub uh, repository. 
And we actually, we love pull requests. We would invite you to come in and um, make changes in our code and try it out. So I want to tell you a little bit about how Rapture is structured and why we made it this way and how it can be used. Uh, one thing I want to tell you is that um, because this attack is quite sophisticated, it's, uh, it's difficult to just make a tool and run it against all endpoints. So if I want to be honest, um, if you want to run Rapture against an endpoint, you need to study a little bit that endpoint. You need to find oh, how the secret behaves, what ciphers it uses, how it compresses things, if there is a known uh, prefix, if there is noise, how this noise behaves, etc. And in that case, you need to configure Rapture to, to make it work. But we're trying to make this process easier. So uh, we call these configuration targets. So you can create a target for the CSRF token of Gmail, for example, or you can create a target for uh, stealing, for example, a Facebook message. And we want to make it as configurable as, uh, as we can, but because this attack is, com is very ad hoc, uh, right now you will have to modify some code if you want to attack a completely new endpoint that does not behave like an existing endpoint. Um, so we don't really pre-ship it with uh, specific targets on uh, sites like Gmail or Facebook, but um, we plan to release, um, to, to make a sample endpoint on Rapture it that you can run it on. It's not ready yet, but we will launch it very soon. And um, we'll introduce a URL here on this HTTPS website that you can experiment with that has zero noise, and so this attack behaves quite quickly, and you can see the bytes being decrypted. And uh, in fact, we'll show you this uh, tool running on a controlled endpoint with uh, limited noise uh, in a few minutes. Right, so this is, um, this is Rupture. Uh, so a little, a little bit about uh, the design of this software. Um, so it's designed to be uh, extensible and modular. Uh, we, we split it up into various components that are completely, um, or they try to be independent of each other. Um, this is different from the proofs of concepts that we, we had until now. Uh, there was uh, some proof of concept by Angelo and some proof of concepts by us, but they were not really reusable and uh, writing new experiments with them w was quite cumbersome. In, in our case, we, have, we split it up into various components. I will show you the components. And this, this allows uh, um, cryptographers to experiment with, for example, the cryptanalysis part without caring about the network part. So, um, for example, we have a specific module for the strategy of, create or of uh, creating new candidates and deciding where the attack will go. And we have a different module for doing the statistical analysis and comparing um, requests and responses and lengths. And in, in those cases, for example, cryptographers can say, oh, okay, we don't want to measure the mean, we don't want to compare the mean, give us the ciphertext and we'll do something clever, more clever. Maybe we will use the higher moments in this distribution. And somehow I will find something else, right? So if you're a cryptographer, please go ahead and change these modules, to create um, new analysts that do, do different comparisons. Maybe you can do something better. Um, or for example, the strategy technique, you can swap between the serial technique and the divide and conquer technique, or if you have something else in mind, maybe you can do that, right? Instead of having a binary tree, maybe you, have, you can have a ternary tree because, oh, okay, it's faster, but it's also a little bit more accurate, so that's the right balance. So it's, it's made to be uh, configurable and extensible in this way. Uh, this is also a general web attack framework. Um, this is interesting. Um, the mechanism I showed you previously, the command and control channel, this is actually something that we do. Um, the Rapture framework deploys a client code that maintains a persistent connection, and this can be used for very many attacks. For example, a crime and poodle, uh, previous attacks against TLS, could be easily coded in, in uh, Rapture. And in fact, we have a team of two master students that are implementing crime right now. Um, it's mitigated, but I mean, it's an interesting experiment. Uh, so if you want to experiment with new attacks, you can just code them up in, uh, in Rupture and see how they work out. Uh, finally, we make it scalable. So if you are an attacker and want to attack multiple victims on multiple networks, you can run one Rupture server and uh, deploy multiple clients and then collect data in a central location so that you can analyze it later or compare it across uh, different endpoints and so on and so forth. All right, so this is... Um, Diagram of our attack. I know it's not very readable, but I will read what it says. Uh, so this is similar to the, or, uh, the first diagram that I showed you, except it shows how the software components um, play a role here in realizing each part of the attack. 
Um, th you can find this shape and a better explanation in our paper that you can find on, on our website. It's much more detailed than what I can say here. So I invite you to, to download it and read it and give us your feedback. Uh, so again, we have one victim here, and the victim is connecting to the web um, through HTTP, insecure HTTP on Amazon, eBay, CNN, DeviantArt. And we have this component which we call the injector. The injector is just a series of better cap scripts, uh, essentially, that what it does is when it sees an HTTP connection go coming through, it puts in some uh, client JavaScript code. And this is the client JavaScript code. Um, this is also our, our code. It's a different module. Uh, the client code is actually quite minimal. We don't do almost anything in this JavaScript portion. Um, this is designed so that it can just receive commands from our server, which is here, the adversarial network, and execute them. So this is actually good for an adversary because if the client receives the malware that we have here, they, they cannot see really what is going on. So if you develop a smarter attack, uh, the client will not really see what's going on. It will just receive commands and execute them in a dummy way. So this is why we made it this way. So this client here uh, makes the victim perform um, HTTPS requests to the target. These could also be protected with HSTS, by the way. We don't care. The, there's no padlock being broken in this attack. The, the victim doesn't see anything. Um, and we have the, the sniffer component here, which is uh, written in Python and also collaborates with the injector to perform ARP spoofing. And this, what this does is it reads uh, data coming in the network, the ciphertext, and simply reports them to the adversarial network. So the idea is that the, the injector and the sniffer, they could run in a small device on the um, victim's network, like a Raspberry Pi maybe. Um, it's really tiny. And uh, the attacker, the adversary, can have a, a more uh, powerful work uh, horse on their own network that can analyze and do anything that is CPU intensive, and we want it to also be persistent. So this is the adversary, and the adversary maintains these services here. We have uh, one service that we call a real-time service. This is written in uh, JavaScript and Node.js. Um, and what this does is it maintains an open WebSocket connection with a client. So this is the command and control channel. Uh, this portion here is not really very clever. What it does is basically keeps the connection open, and then it allows the uh, farther backend to take the decisions on how to, how to move with the attack, what kind of work it sends to the client, and so on. So the, the real core of, of our work is here. This Python um, script is based on, on Django. And what it does is it has two important components called the strategy and the analyst. The strategy is responsible for driving the attack and taking decisions, um, dealing with things like divide and conquer or sequential attacks, um, dealing with things such as the padding, um, and essentially, in the end, receiving data from the sniffer and sending um, what, they, what the strategy wants to do. It tells it to the real-time service, which forwards it to the client. Uh, we also have the analyst, which does the statistical, um, statistical part of the attack. So what it can do is it compares just two distributions based on samples. So this is completely mathematical, and it's, it's a good place for crypto cryptographers to experiment because they don't have to deal with any of the networking stuff. They just see some samples that have been collected, and then they have to write code that compares things. So they can do smarter things in there. So you can see how we made it modular in this way. And finally, we have a SQLite database where we persistently store the data of the attack. Uh, so all the data, all the ciphertexts collected are put there, and um, this can be analyzed again in the future. Of course, this attack is adaptive, but if you want to keep the specific adaptation that we use, you can reanalyze this data in the future with potentially new methods and see if they work uh, the same or not. Um, and if the victim, of course, if the network, victim network goes down, if the victim shuts down their computer, you still have a persistent, um, your persistent data right there and uh, you can keep it outside of the network that can be more uh, unstable. All right, so this was the uh, attack framework there. Uh, one nice thing is the persistence of the attack. So uh, this, is, this is nice. I think it's not very novel, but uh, I don't think anybody has like, implemented it in code. I mean, we all know that it was possible, but now it's actually easier. So uh, what I mean by persistence is, well, when the, when the victim opens multiple tabs, on their browser, uh, all of them are injected with the, um, with the malware uh, JavaScript that we have, the client. And this client makes connections back to the real-time service, which keeps open connections with all the open tabs. Uh, and what it does is it keeps all the tabs uh, dormant, 
and it wakes up only one tab at a time, and it, uh, it tells it to, to do work, right? To issue requests to the target website. And, um, well, the good part about this is if the user closes that tab, then another tab wakes up and can pick up the attack from where the first tab left off. Uh, or even if the, um, the victim closes a browser and opens a new browser, or they reboot their computer and log in back in a few hours, the attack can continue, right? So we have this powerful robustness mechanism where the attack can pick up from where it left off. And because we have this database that keeps the data uh, running, like if, if the network goes down and comes back up, we can pick up from where we left off. I think this is uh, quite nice. Right, so I already told you about the SQLite portion. And um, we now are ready to show you how Rapture works in a short demo. So let's take a look at this. Right, so can you zoom in a little bit? I don't think they can see it. Okay, a little bit more maybe? Okay, great. So here is the repository of Rupture, and we have a master script, rupture.sh, and what this does is it basically runs all of the components together so that you don't have to run them on your own. But if you want to distribute them in the way that I said, oh, on separate networks, you can totally do that. And now it's um, cleaning up the old database that we had running. And um, we have set up the database, and now it has deployed all the various systems on the network, right? So it's running the backend, it's running the sniffer, it's running everything. And now assume the victim visits some URL that can be infected, right? So in this case, we'll just fire up the, uh, an HTML file that just contains the client script. But imagine this could be any URL and could be a browsing uh, in, in progress, right? So already you can see there's 16 requests at a time, boom, 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 right? This is 1.5 seconds. And uh, here you've already seen like 16 completed requests. I don't know if we can zoom in here to see like the URLs. That would be really nice. All right, so this is attacking a controlled endpoint of, of our part. I'm running it on my personal website. And interestingly, it uses exactly the same ciphers as Gmail and Facebook. It uses AES-128. It uh, uses trunking, and um, the attack works. Right, so in this case, we're showing a sequential version of the attack. Um, this makes the explanation clearer. And um, you can see this is the, the known secret, impair. And we're trying one character, in this case, A. And we're adding the pool, the Hoffman pool, to achieve a fixed point. And here we have the, um, the alignment padding, right? So you can see 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. Uh, maybe I should explain what this is here. This is a, a part of the uh, URL that is not reflected. We call it an anti-caching parameter. And what this does is basically, if, if we repeat exactly the same request, because we sometimes have to do that if the result is inconclusive due to noise unrelated to block ciphers, then this will cause the browser to do the request again because we change it and it's not cached. So that's a small detail there. Um, and um, here is the backend that's running and outputting stuff. Of course, this is all stored in the database, but it's just uh, also outputting here. And you can see the length that is being leaked on the network and the number of TLS records that are being recorded. You can see it's actually quite fast. And um, OK, we have a confidence of one. This means that we, uh, we have a difference of one byte. And this actually was a, so this was a byte that was collected. So D is, in fact, the correct byte in this case. And we have decrypted one byte of uh, HTTPS. And this took about 30 seconds for this, uh, for this case. Well, actually, in this case, you can see that we have uh, collected two bytes already, because uh, our known prefix uh, in our control site was impaired. So we have already collected D and I. And if I go a little higher, you can see the time that we, yes. Uh, can uh, we also right, see like the? Um, right here, yeah. we stole the D character, the first byte. And uh, in, the next, uh, in the next batch, we stole I, and with a confidence of one, where one actually you want to yeah, so let's, let's show them the, uh, the lengths of the various alphabet, right? So each of the alphabet, uh, so you can see here, um, there is one, uh, one block difference from the next best, right? Um, there's also some noise happening. So uh, there's also another character made that probably matched a different part of the plain text here um, that also resulted in a slightly shorter length, but this one won in this case. So you can see sometimes there's matching with different parts of the, the plain text going on. Um, and you can see the difference is exactly 16 bytes in, in this case. Um, 
so one of the things I want to mention is the, the confidence of, of one. This is basically the result of running 16 uh, requests per character, right? So uh, one of them only uh, does the, plays a difference, right? The other ones, because they have the wrong padding and there is no block alignment, um, they, do not, they do not play a difference. And uh, another thing I want to show you is there's actually a failed request here. It just happened so uh, in this demo. So yeah, here, reported unsuccessful capture, right? So sometimes we, uh, the, the capture doesn't really work and there's maybe a, a little bit of, um, yeah, maybe the network doesn't behave as uh, we thought, right? Maybe it sends a, a, more TLS records. And when we see um, something that goes out of the usual in the number of TLS records that we corrected, that we collected or anything like that, we just drop that sample. And, and in the case where we, um, where we have a closed tab or something like that by the user, this is exactly what's going to happen, right? So we just throw away the sample set of 16, uh, 16 records that we collected with 16 requests, and we just reissue it in a new tab, right? So this is exactly what's happening here. But, but in this case, it's not a closed tab. It's maybe something that went wrong on the network, maybe a dropped packet or a TCP retransmission, something like that. So it actually behaved well uh, in this case also. Um, but if we move on to the third byte, you'll see um, it may require multiple batches to converge to the right character. So maybe uh, running 16 requests per character may not be enough, and it may need to, to redo it, right? So in this case, you see a confidence of zero, because everything is the same, or not everything is the same, but the top, the top two ones have the same, right? So this is probably a, a, a match with a different portion of the plaintext, and uh, by, by um, changing the... Uh, alignment alphabet, maybe we can uh, look, look at it uh, closer. Okay, and uh, we have a few more slides, I think. Yes. Right, so this is the, um, the expected runtime. We have maybe three, three minutes per byte um, because of all the noise that we, we showed you. Uh, but if you use divide and conquer, you, drop, you can drop it maybe to 30 seconds. This is not as good as the original breach, which broke a whole... Uh, a whole secret in 30 seconds. But we believe using these uh, persistent techniques, uh, you, you can stay in the network and keep collecting data and eventually break the secret. It's not unreasonable for a person to stay in Starbucks for an hour or two, and you can easily uh, steal secrets in this case while they browse the, the internet. And by the way, you can attack multiple targets at the same time um, using multiple tabs. It doesn't matter, right? You can parallelize these. Okay, so how do we propose to mitigate this attack? Well, um, in the original breach paper, there were several mitigation techniques proposed, but um, some of them are good ideas, but we don't think they uh, fundamentally solve the problem. I want to uh, just touch on one of, the, um, one of the mitigation techniques mentioned in the original paper, which was quite interesting, which was to separate the secrets from the um, reflection. And uh, this might work for things like the CSRF tokens. But in case of, for example, Facebook messages, you can use Facebook messages both as a reflection and as a secret. So if, you, if your goal is to steal a private Facebook message, what you can do as an attacker is you can add the victim as a friend on Facebook. And to execute this attack, what you do is you keep sending them private messages and then your own attacker private messages get compressed with the private messages of the victim that you want to steal, with the secret ones, right? So these are secrets that are both, both secrets and reflections, essentially. And they're very hard to separate. You, you can't really put them in, like, different compression contexts without losing um, the uh, efficiency of your compression. So uh, we think for some, for some things it works, but not for everything. Um, so some techniques um, that were actually proposed to mitigate the CSRF in general um, work against breach very effectively. One of these is uh, first-party cookies, and this uh, was actually proposed by Mike West in RFC, that is in draft stage, and um, we are working with him to get it in Chrome 51. In fact, he actually implemented it, and uh, he implemented it to avoid CSRF tokens. Um, but it comes as a very good response to this talk, because once this is implemented, it also mitigates the breach attack completely. So what you do is very simple. When you set your cookie, you opt in to be first party, right? So you write this in your cookie, and now what happens is your cookie is no longer sent in cross-origin requests. And that means that the breach attack, because it is based on only cross-origin requests, no longer works because the responses of the cross-origin requests don't contain any secrets. They're just logged out pages. 
So this is a very good, um, a good response to our talk. And on April 8th, actually, Chrome is being released with this feature. So um, this is really great for the security of the web. We have about one week to experiment. <laughs> All right. So um, I would recommend if you're a web developer, if you own a web application, or if you are a consul security consultant for a web application, um, you can opt in for this. Um, the browsers that don't support it will just ignore it. The browsers that do support it will start um, taking this into account in a week. Um, and this means that your, your website will be secure from attacks uh, like breach. So to end, um, I want to propose some future work. Uh, generally, we welcome patches in Rupture. We think it's, um, it's a good framework to, to work on. And we invite you to come and help us uh, develop there. We have many bugs open on GitHub. One very important issue is that we don't have Speedy support. And Google is actually using Speedy heavily. Uh, so this means we cannot really attack Google uh, or, other, or other websites that use Speedy. But we have very good indicators that our attack would work against Speedy as well. Uh, there is no reason why it wouldn't. Um, and then if you help with browser development, if you're a Firefox developer or if you have access to these developers, we urge you to help with uh, first-party cookie implementation. That would be great. And if you're a web application developer, please, um, please add this uh, cookie to your website. All right, so the, the key takeaways of this talk, um, first, HTTPS with gzip is still broken, and it's, um, it's worse than the previous time. Uh, second, Rupture Framework is live, um, so attackers can use it now. Um, so please take this attack more seriously, because it's going to happen in the wild. Um, and do enable first-party cookies on your web app, uh, because this really mitigates the attack. And uh, with that, I will end the talk. And uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, we'll be very happy to answer them. OK, any questions? Uh, can you bring the microphone back, please? It's like a good presentation. I have a question about the so future framework. So uh, you mentioned so, uh, black training. What does it mean, I mean black training? Rupture. Black, black training. Mm -hmm. uh, could you back to the uh, uh, fra future work? Yes. And uh, black tracking. Oh, black tracking. Yes, I didn't mention that. I'm sorry, I skipped that. Uh, thanks for the question. Okay, so what is backtracking is the question. So um, sometimes, so, so the goal of Rapture is essentially to get the whole plain text, not just one secret. So sometimes, in this case, we even showed you this. Uh, when you expand a secret, sometimes there's a match between um, different portions of the plain text. So you can get a match on your target secret, but also a match on a different secret. Uh, so Rupture doesn't really handle it that well right now. But what we want to do is, um, and this, the, the structure and the module structure of this framework actually allow this, allows us quite a lot, is we want to try all the possible paths. Uh, in that case, we will decrypt both secrets. right? So what you do is, OK, you, you know four characters, and then you have a list of 24 kind or 26 candidates. And two of them match, right? So you say, OK, we have two secrets that match. Maybe, maybe both of them are in the plaintext. So you go one path, and you explore. You find out what happened. And then you backtrack. And then you say, OK, I will explore the other path that was also promising. In that case, I can store both secrets that were uh, captured by, by Rapture. So this is what backtracking means. And uh, we're working on implementing this. We, uh, we are hoping it will be on, on the repository soon. Thank you. Actually, I, I do have a question. Um, so this first party cookie magic that I was completely unaware of, um, does it apply to iframes and pop-ups or only to you know, JavaScript, XHRs, and images? I mean, is it really not sending the session cookie if you create an iframe or if you open a new pop-up? What are, what are some of the limitations? Uh, I don't know about this. So the question here is, 
Does first party cookie only involve uh, AJAX request or image requests, or does it also work for iframes, right? I don't know. You have to read the standard, and I'm also curious about this. We have to take a look. And I'm also curious about the implementation to see if it will correspond to the standard. Uh, but I'm hoping it will work for, for all of these. If it doesn't, maybe we should, we should fix it. Yeah, but it's a good step, I think. OK, any more questions? Is a question on the back? No? Oh, there. Hi. Hi, I'm Darren from the register, Darren Pauly. Um You mentioned that um, you think that this is going to be used in attacks in the wild? Yes. Would you say, given, like, considering the complexity of it, how long do you reckon that could possibly take? Like, You want to take this question? Sure. Yes, okay, so this is actually a nice question because... Uh, during our research, we were reading an article uh, about the mitigation of crime. So in this article, a professor at uh, Johns Hopkins, a cryptography professor, said that uh, crime is actually not an attack that can be used uh, against you in uh, a coffee shop or Starbucks or something like that. It's an attack that uh, uh, regimes can use in order to track and uh, find dissidents. So I think this more or less applies also to breach. It's not. It's a pretty sophisticated attack. It's not easily to. Uh, it's not easy to implement it and use it against uh, uh, targets like me or you. I hope, uh, but uh, it would be possible for organizations or governments or regimes to use it in order to bypass securities in uh, 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 websites that use HTTPS. So, it may not be. Uh, so dangerous against us, but it is dangerous, and we have to mitigate it. Right, but I think, I think with the introduction of Rapture, once people start writing target configurations for specific endpoints, it's going to be much easier. So the, yeah, it's, it's, it's lowering like, the complexity of the attack quite a bit because the implementation is now ready. So uh, I think the, it, it would be good to have this First party cookie feature uh, in the browser is maybe in the next month. Um, but we have, well, the patch for Chrome is ready, so it's shipping in the next release. Uh, we will push for other browser vendors to also do that. Uh, I would say if, if you have a, like a ready target, you don't need too much, right? You, don't, you need maybe a couple of weeks to maybe target a specific person or. Yeah, actually, all you have to do is, uh, as Dionysus mentioned, uh, networks are pretty much ad hoc as we attack it. So you have to analyze the network, see the, the type of requests you take, the type of records you take, and uh, see how you can uh, do this. So at first, we couldn't uh, even attack the noiseless endpoint Dionysus had, and we actually did it in the last week. But uh, if you analyze the requests and see a pattern that emerges from the responses, it is not so difficult to do it, actually. Yes. If the assumptions, of course, are met. Yeah. Please, please play with the tool, though. So please, please run it and see how it works for you. OK, uh, any other questions in the audience? Yeah, I think that's it. Right, thank you very much for your time. And if you have any more questions, we can, we'll be here for two days.